and good afternoon or good morning and welcome to the COVID-19 Legal Information for LGBTQI and 2S Communities webinar presented by EGAL Canada. This is episode two and we're in British Columbia. EGAL is a national advocacy organization for LGBTQI 2S people. EGAL improves lives through research, education, awareness and legal advocacy. After today's BC-centered webinar, we will travel east across the country for five more episodes, each with a regional focus addressing housing and employment. My name is Gitanjali Lina, and I'm the host of this webinar series on COVID legal information. I'm personally connected to BC's social justice movements and issues because back in the 90s, I moved to Vancouver from Ottawa to attend university. And because of the activism and visibility of so many Indigenous nations on unceded territory, I came to realize that even as an immigrant, I could also become a settler and benefit from the current state of colonialism on Turtle Island. So let's take a look at the current picture of British Columbia in this COVID-19 pandemic. The province has, since the start of the pandemic, recorded a total of 77,263 COVID-19 cases, and there have been 1,335 related deaths. There have been outbreaks at hospitals and food processing plants. But there are other pre-existing crises in British Columbia. For example, the unabating levels of people dying from drug overdoses, the dearth of affordable and adequate housing, and the lack of paid sick days for the majority of British Columbians. Five years ago, BC declared a public health emergency for overdose deaths. Now the chief coroner reported that 2020 was the highest year of drug deaths. It's a 74% increase over the 29, 2019 death toll of 984. The highest number of deaths occurred in Surrey, Victoria, and Vancouver. It's gotten to the point where Vancouver's mayor has called for decriminalizing drugs to halt decades of harmful drug policies that causes the crisis in part. There's also an affordable housing crisis for many segments of the population, including youth, drug users, low-income people, sex workers, and students. Provincially legislated paid sick days remain a key advocacy point for workers as a public, public health and employment safety issue. Low-income workers, youth, seniors, and workers in the manufacturing industry, as well as people outside of Metro Vancouver, are less likely to have paid sick days, according to the Canadian Center of Policy Alternatives recent study, than their urban counterparts who make more than 60K annually. Unionized workers are also more likely to have paid sick days through a collective agreement. Thus, public sector workers are more likely to have paid sick days than private sector or under the table workers. Our panel of experts come from community legal and anti-violence and anti-poverty work in Vancouver. And before I introduce our guests, I'm going to uh, share a question that we received in advance from a viewer. The question is, I am very interested, this came from Stephen, I'm very interested in the extent to which both our access to employment and housing have been compromised during the pandemic. So that's a question that our three guests will ably answer. Uh, our first guest is TJ Felix from Pivot Legal Society. TJ is a Sequempem Mech First Nations artist, musician, activist, and uninvited guest on the unceded lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. Their lived experiences with homelessness, addiction, mental health, and recovery have taught them the importance of community-based outreach, culturally sensitive resources, and peer support. TJ is a graduate of the Indigenous Land Stewardship Certificate Program at the Native Education College where they were encouraged to learn about their traditional laws, ceremonies, medicines, and language. TJ, welcome to our webinar. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Jolly. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, 
My name is TJ Felix. I'm the community educator at Pivot Legal Society. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that um, my expertise are not in housing law, although I will be speaking on that. Um, I'm coming from a place of lived experience and uh, also the lived experiences of the community that I work with and stand with on a daily basis. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I just want to start off with a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that uh, Pivot's office is located on the stolen lands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And we are grateful to the host nations for the continuous relationship with their lands and are committed to learning to work in solidarity as accomplices in shifting the colonial default. I would also like to acknowledge first that the, the issues I'll be talking about today disproportionately affect Indigenous people, as the Downton East side has the highest proportion of Indigenous people in Vancouver at 31%. And uh, I guess we'll start off with um, some terms, just uh, for clarity. Uh, SROs, these are typically small single rooms, about 10 by 10 feet with a shared bathroom on each floor and a shared kitchen. They were built at the turn of the 20th century for seasonal workers in the resource industry and over time became the last stop before homelessness. The Downtown East Side. The Downtown East Side is one of the oldest neighborhoods in Vancouver and is home to roughly 15,000 people, over half of which are precariously housed or unhoused. PWLE, which stands for people with lived experience with one or more forms of oppression who are often consulted for their expertise. And lastly, BC Housing, which is a provincially funded crown agency under the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing operating at arm's length from government. And I wanted to ground the presentation in just giving some context uh, around the multiple crises that have affected the Downton East side um, much before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so Vancouver's last homelessness count identified 2,095 experiencing homeless, homelessness. It's actually estimated now that the number of unhoused people in the Downton East side has risen to roughly 3,000 according, <laughs> sorry, to roughly 3,000 people, according to the Downton East Side response team. The single, uh, the social assistance shelter rate is $375 per month for a single person, while the monthly rent of price of an SRO room is often much higher, but still not enough revenue for landlords of privately owned buildings to make much needed repairs. The rental price of a single occupancy room can range anywhere from $375 to 1,500 with there often being little difference in living conditions. These hotels have mostly have shared bathrooms and kitchens, which are poorly maintained and have led to tenants getting infections, rodent and bug infestations, windowless rooms, and bad plumbing, which are just a few examples of issues these hotels have. Many of the, many, or, sorry, <laughs> can you go back to the, yeah, thank you. Many actively choose to live outdoors instead of in these conditions. There are also many who would live in SROs but have wrongly been evicted or unable to access social assistance. These are just a couple of examples of the many systemic barriers that contribute to homelessness. 1,716 people died due to illicit drug overdoses in 2020, more than ever before in a single year. In the five long years since the crisis was declared, there have been 6,733 preventable deaths across BC. And although there has been progress, such as the city voting un unanimously to decriminalize small amounts of illicit drugs and the passing of a safe supply program, there's still increasing numbers of overdose deaths. I choose to call this the harmful drug policy, as I believe calling it by any other name minimizes how complicit policymakers and governmental bodies are in these deaths. Some call it a toxic drug supply crisis, but this narrative only serves to further criminalize and over-police population. We need to be aware that many street level dealers are also survivors of the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. um, during the summer of 2020, the Downton East Side reportedly had the lowest number of cases. 
In November, the BC Center for, for uh, Disease Control announced that the Dachinese side now had the highest number of COVID cases. And there's been little effort on behalf of Vancouver Coastal Health to offer trauma-informed education around the COVID-19 virus. And this has resulted in a loss of faith from a community already disaffected by a complex history with the healthcare system. The housing and harmful drug policy crises have disproportionately affected the Dachinese side long before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about supportive housing, which uh, many lower income people and marginalized folk um, access in the Dachinese side and around uh, and also across BC. BC Housing describes supportive housing as subsidized housing with on-site supports. These supports help you find and maintain housing stability. If you're applying to supportive housing, you may require supports related to mental health and or substance use and or other challenges that may put you at higher risks of homelessness. Housing providers may have you sign a program agreement instead of a lease. According to Residential Tenancy Policy Guideline 46, emergency shelters, transitional housing, supportive housing, supportive housing should be covered by the Residential Tenancy Act. And under Section 5 of the RTA, the Residential Tenancy Act, landlords and tenants cannot avoid or contract out of the act or regulations. So any policies put in place by supportive housing providers must be consistent with the act and regulations. But we know that, in fact, many housing providers routinely act as if their buildings are not covered by the RTA. In fact, it is common for people to sign program agreements and similar documents when they move into, into supportive housing, in which they agree not to, not to having some or all of their RTA protections. People tend to sign these agreements because it is, because it is their only option, and they do so without being provided proper legal advice about the impacts of these agreements. Signing a program agreement means that you are not protected under the Residential Tenancy Act because according to the housing provider, you are not a tenant. These program agreements are often very long and full of restrictions and conditions that don't consider their unique needs and also strip them of their agency. As a result, landlords can arbitrarily evict residents as they see fit. There have been very few cases brought forward in this area. This is likely because most legal advocates are funded to bring cases under the RTA, not to bring cases challenging the fact buildings are being wrongful, wrongfully excluded from the RTA in the first place. Yeah. And of course, most tenants cannot afford to pay for lawyers privately. The victims of this are often those most at risk, otherwise referred to as hard to house, due to mental physical health barriers, drug use, and being involved in the illicit marketplace. And many do not have the capacity to dispute eviction notices and are thrown back into housing insecurity indefinitely. Pivot has reached out to BC Housing a number of times, asking them to clarify which buildings on the supportive housing registration lists are covered by the RTA. For the buildings that are not protected, on what basis are they being exempted from RTA protection? BC Housing is yet to respond. Deaths in supportive housing are at an all time high. The number of deaths in supportive housing in the first seven months of 2020 alone doubled that of 2019, with 99 residents and guests dying. These buildings are often inaccessible and don't have elevators or have elevators that are in disrepair. This is unacceptable for those that have mobility issues. Since the COVID-19 lockdown measure measures were announced, many buildings adopted a strict guest policy, which didn't allow people to have visitors. For someone that relies on the care of their friends, family, or support worker, this is incredibly isolating and potentially deadly. Lastly, restrictive guest policies put drug users and sex workers at risk. Restrictive guest policies have been ongoing since the beginning of the pandemic. These restrictions can lead to substance users using while alone and sex workers having to work outdoors in increasingly dangerous circumstances. These guest restrictions have also resulted in higher numbers of calls to police and have been used as grounds for the police to barge into rooms without warrants claiming to investigate suspected COVID violations. During the pandemic, 
the BC Residential Tenancy Branch granted landlords the power to schedule or restrict use of common shared areas like lobbies and laundry rooms. But they do not have the power to stop visitors from coming to someone's apartment. Supportive housing is meant to serve those that are most vulnerable, but often only serves to further marginalize them. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, just some imagery. This is from 2017 um, in a building called the Balmoral, which was uh, slated for, uh, or it was closed down um, and emptied due to being in just, just complete disrepair. This is a picture of one of the stairwells. Um, that's This is Wendy Peterson, a member of the Vancouver Tenant Union, um, the SRO Collaborative, as well as many other things. And here is also just a photo of one of the rooms after a tenant had vacated. And um, yeah, the Balmoral was shut down in 2017 after it was deemed unsafe to live in and was at risk of collapsing. Um, it's unfortunately not out of the ordinary and advocates and tenants have consistently criticized the city for allowing these buildings to fall into disrepair. In 2003, the standards of maintenance bylaw was passed, which would allow the city to do repairs and bill the owner of a building if the owner failed to comply with maintenance standards. This bylaw has never been used though, according to Wendy Peterson. And uh, this is Atira Property Management which is a housing operator that runs several SRO hotels owned by the provincial government in the downtown east side. The company is a subsidiary of Atira Women's Resource Society, a nonprofit organization committed to ending violence against women. During the early stages of the pandemic, Atira, as well as the three other major housing providers in the downtown east side, uh, Lookout, Portland Hotel Society, and Rain City were heavily criticized criticized for banning guests, which many believe contributed to the high number of deaths in supportive housing in 2020. PJ, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about uh, tenant activism and organizing in the downtown east side. You mentioned the Vancouver Tenants Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, Vancouver Tenants Union, um, they represent um, thousands of members across Vancouver, 2,000 members roughly, and um, the building a base of tenants throughout the city to establish political power to create ch change and advocate um, and to fight for the rights of tenants and the preservation of affordable housing. And I um, also wanted to touch on SRO C and Toro quickly. Um, this is a, a organization um, that, you know, the Downtown East Side SRO Collaborative Society, they employ tenant organizers and privately owned SROs to work on habitability, safety campaigns, and to stop burn evictions that cause homelessness. Uh, the Toro program, the Tenant Overdose Response Organizers, uses a similar model to prevent overdose deaths in private SROs. And um, they have tenants that are working out of um, each individual hotel in the downtown east side right. to offer harm reduction supplies. And they've um, also extended their services to distribute PPE, um, clothing, food, um, just about everything um, people need to survive. <laughs> yeah, they must have really had to up their game during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, the community has been grieving a lot of loss recently. And uh, unfortunately, there have been a number of deaths of members of the Toro program. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to end my presentation by honoring them and the amazing work that they've done in the past to save lives and support people in the downtown east side. Thank you so much for sharing from your work experience and lived experience um, about these issues and these advocacy efforts. Mm -hmm. um, TJ will return when we um, finish our third speaker and we'll have a short panel discussion and I will introduce our second speaker Oh, and by the way, please send us your questions and comments so that we can take them, we can take questions at the end in the Q&A. So our next speaker is Kevin Love, is a lawyer at the Community Legal Aid Society's Community Law Program. 
He works primarily in the areas of mental health and workers' rights. Prior to joining the community law program, Kevin worked in Class's mental health law program, representing clients who were detained in psychiatric facilities under the criminal code. Kevin represents Class on the WorkSafe BC's Policy and Practice Consultative Committee, and Kevin chairs the Workers' Compensation Advocacy Group. Kevin also acts as the supervising lawyer for the First United Church's Legal Advocacy Program in the downtown east side. Welcome, Kevin. Hi, it's very nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Great. So I was going to um, um, uh, shift focus a bit and talk a little bit about some uh, employment related issues and some of the related um, uh, employment benefits that uh, people might be uh, accessing um, because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but I'll start by giving just a brief overview of uh, CLASS, Community Legal Assistance Society. So we're a um, um, uh, a group of lawyers and advocates and um, uh, support staff who provide help uh, mainly in five areas, uh, income security, housing security, workers' rights, uh, mental health, and human rights. Um, and we are uh, based in Vancouver um, and our offices, and indeed I'm broadcasting today from the uh, the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and uh, Tsleil-Waututh uh, nations. So, um, I'm sure as people can appreciate, it's a fairly massive topic to talk about all the employment related impacts and um, and related benefit issues that have been generated by the uh, pandemic. So I'm hoping to just address this at a fairly high level. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pandemic has really exposed, I would say, a lot of cracks and problems in our um, our social security net and our employment uh, related rights. Um, a lot of these have been ongoing for a very long time. I think a lot of people know that, but the pandemic has really dragged them out to the forefront and um, and really focused attention uh, on them. So um, there's sort of two components I hope to address. One is the, the short-term response, uh, which has been necessary, but also there's a long-term component here that um, I think we do need to use this opportunity to build some activism for, for change uh, in the long-term and going forward um, to really um, strengthen our employment laws and, um, and build a better um, uh, system of uh, security for, for workers. Um, so of all the programs uh, that have uh, really been exposed during this pandemic, uh, employment insurance is probably top of mind. Um, employment insurance is a pillar of our um, social security system. Uh, it's a program that dates back uh, 80 some odd years. Um, and I think as most people know, it's a program that provides benefits when people lose their jobs for reasons uh, beyond their control. And it also provides some benefits for people when um, they need some time off work, haven't necessarily lost their job and need some time off work, for example, due to a pregnancy, caring for a new, um, a new child, they're sick, or perhaps they're caring for um, a loved one who's uh, critically ill. Um, and EI is funded entirely by um, workers' employers. So everybody, when they get their paycheck on Friday, it's never quite as much as you hope because you see there's that deduction for EI. But that's supposed to mean that the system is there for you when you need it. But over time, um, we're finding that it, it hasn't been. Um, there was a time when 80% of uh, people out of work could access or were receiving EI benefits. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we were down at about 40. And this, of course, was um, a real a real problem. So um, when the pandemic hit, the employment ins insurance system was pretty ill-equipped to deal with the tidal wave of unemployment that uh, came through. And I'll um, um, I'll come back to the some of the entry requirements for EI and some of the programs that the government has put in place to patch these gaps, but. Um, people might recall the rollout of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, um, and that was the first $500 a week payment uh, through the spring and the summer of this year. That was really designed to do two things. Um, one, to cover a lot of the workers who weren't captured by the EI system, but also to push back a lot of those EI claims where the government figured out how are we going to respond, and they needed uh, time to do that. Um, 
And so this this bought the government time. And then in September, we finally um, heard how the EI program was going to be temporarily reformed. And there's three um, key features I'd like to, to highlight for people, um, because a lot of people um, may not associate with the EI system because they've never been in work that they think would be covered or they haven't been doing enough work to think uh, that they're covered. And now um, they very much might be. So um, the first um, thing to note is that the number of hours people need to qualify for EI has been drastically reduced. Um, that's how you qualify for EI by working a certain number of hours and you count them up. And that's usually usually in the last year. And that's what's used to decide if you qualify. And usually, maybe, Is that number different across BC, depending on where you live? Like, is it higher in Vancouver and lower, like the number of hours you need to be eligible? Yes, usually it is. Usually it varies between 420 and 700 hours, depending on where you live and the unemployment rate in that region. But um, the changes that have been brought in have made that number uh, 120 hours everywhere. So everybody, no matter where they are right now, can qualify for EI with um, 120 hours. And for some of those special benefits I was talking about, uh, for people who haven't necessarily lost a job but need time off work, um, could be because of pregnancy, could have been caring for a new uh, child, caring for a critically ill family member, or you yourself are, are sick, um, it's a flat rate of 300 now. It used to be 600, uh, now it's 300. So, um, you know, the key takeaway here is that the number of hours needed to drop, and there's a lot more people um, who may previously not have been eligible for EI who now would be. Um, the second big uh, change has been the minimum benefit rate. So um, it used to be that um, your EI would be tied to how much you were earning before. And for a lot of low income earners, it wasn't a lot of money that EI provided. Right. Um, now we have a minimum rate of $500 a week. So everybody um, is going to get at least that no matter what they were earning before. And then the final change I just want to highlight is um, a lot of people, particularly who are um, precariously employed or um, maybe hadn't done a lot of work, are used to getting very a very small number of weeks. Well, the government um, has just recently uh, bumped up um, the the minimum number of weeks people can access uh, to fifty, which is quite quite a jump. So, if people are looking for work but are unable to get back to work, um, they're going to be able to access at least. Um, uh, uh, 50 weeks of EI benefits. So those are, um, that's a snapshot of some of the major changes that have been made to make EI benefits um, uh, more accessible to a range of, of people. Um, now, of course, as we know, even with those changes, there's still going to be a lot of workers out there who just um, aren't able to access the EI program. Uh, this could be because they're self-employed, um, or for, for other reasons. So uh, to cover these folks, um, right now the government has a, a, another program, which is the uh, Canada Recovery Benefit. And the cover, Canada Recovery Benefit also pays um, $500 a week, um, but access to that is not based on hours worked, but based on earnings. So like the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, um, you access that program by having earned five thousand dollars either in 2019, 2020, or in the last 12 months, and you can keep getting the benefit if your usual weekly earnings, uh, average weekly earnings, have been cut um, in half. If you're trying to work, but your average uh, weekly earnings are are cut in half. So there's still some barriers. I'm sure people are experiencing um, the need to file tax returns. Um, the access to technology has been a big problem for a lot of people. Um, right, who, because it's who, best to get those online, right, through CRA? That's it. Yeah, there's a, a real reliance on CRA, uh, the Canada Revenue Agency, and having um, an, a, an online account, um, and that's been very difficult for people. Um, there's also been um, um, a number of other barriers uh, for people who have uh, who receive other income, for example, from the provincial government, um, and even though it shouldn't impact your eligibility, reporting that income has caused delays. So um, there have been a lot of barriers to to folks accessing these payments, but they are there, um, and um, you know people should know and um, try to um, uh, try to access them if they can. And did CRB totally replace the C the CERB? 
Yes, it, it's the successor program. And right. the major difference in the programs is there is a requirement for the Canada uh, Recovery Benefit, like EI, to be looking for work. And that's that's a, a very um, important uh, change. Um, along with the Canada Recovery Benefit, there's two other benefits people should know about. Um, and I'm going to come back to the, what is a really important issue about uh, paid sick time, uh, hopefully in a moment. But um, there is the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefits, which can provide uh, now, uh, it's now expanded up to four weeks of uh, benefits for people who miss half their shifts in a week because um, of, uh, for COVID related reasons. Um, and there's also the Canada Recovery Caregiver Benefit. Um, and if uh, people need time off work to care for um, uh, someone who is impacted by COVID or maybe it's your, your children who are out of school or what have you. Um, uh, there's um, the, the Canada Recovery Caregiver Benefit that is um, that is available. Now, unfortunately, um, it would take all our time to go through the nuts and bolts of all these programs, but, um, but that's at least a high level snapshot of some of the, um, uh, the federal benefits that are available. Um, Kevin, is there anywhere that viewers could look to to be able to find out more details about the caregiver benefit? Yes, if, if um, the the government of Canada has produced a number of fact sheets, frequently asked questions. Uh, so you know, if you just um, uh, Google the Canada Recovery Caregiver Benefit, those should come up. And if you go to our website, classbc.net, uh, we also have um, a frequently asked questions resource there that can hopefully. Um, give people some, some guidance. And then the, um, uh, the, the other benefit um, I just wanted to highlight quickly is um, the BC recovery benefit. So everything I've talked about so far comes from the government of, um, of Canada, but the government of BC has also introduced um, the Canada recovery uh, benefit. And this is a one-time payment. It's not an ongoing thing. It's a one-time payment up to $1,000 for families, $500 for single people. Um, and it's available to most low and uh, middle wage earners. And again, um, if you, uh, there, there's lots of information uh, about the, the mechanics and the nuts and bolts and how to apply um, available uh, if you just uh, look up the BC recovery benefit. But it's uh, it's available until uh, I believe June thirtieth of this year, and people should should apply for it if they're they're eligible. Um, so that that you know that that covers off some of the um, uh, the, you know, the the benefits that are available for people who are out of work and uh, remain out of work. But of course, um, there have been a lot of people who um, continue to work, and um, it's been a challenging time for anyone working. Um, and it's uh, a lot of workers um, are being made to do more for less in very stressful situations. And frankly, uh, in some unsafe situations. Yeah. Um, and so we do want to acknowledge that. And there have been some changes uh, that have been, uh, that have been made for people who, um, who are working that I just um, like to highlight. Um, uh, the first um, has to do with um, WCB workers' compensation. Um, most people will know them in British Columbia by the name WorkSafe BC. And as some people will know, um, workplace safety and benefits for people who are, uh, are injured or get sick at work are all run through the WCB system. And uh, back in the summer, um, BC became at the time uh, the first province uh, to introduce uh, presumptive coverage for um, uh, workers who uh, are exposed to an elevated level of COVID risk at work and then get sick. And what I mean by that is um, a tricky thing for WorkSafe BC can often be trying to prove that your work is what caused the um, the um, injury. Yeah. yeah the injury. But and especially for something like COVID, if we think about it, how is anyone supposed to prove exactly where they um, contracted uh, COVID? You may never know. Um, so the this presumption will mean that people who are, are working 
um, through the, the pandemic for the good of us all. And a lot of people who don't have the luxury like I do of working from home, um, if they do contract COVID and they are um, exposed to um, uh, an elevated level of risk above the general public, it's going to be presumed that uh, they contracted COVID um, at work. And which they don't have to benefits. prove it. That's right. If, they don't um, have to provide proof. They don't necessarily need to provide any additional proof. Um, if the evidence shows that someone got it somewhere else, um, that may be enough to overturn the presumption. But um, the starting point is going to be that if you are exposed to an elevated level of risk above the general public um, because of the work you do, uh, we're going to presume that COVID um, was caused by work. Um, and so the the um, the final thing I just want to wrap up and mention is um, the government did introduce uh, sick leave um, for uh, workers who need time off um, uh, for for COVID related reasons. And of course, we don't want people in our workplaces um, uh, who may be may be sick. Uh, we want people staying home. Um, so on the one hand, uh, it's helpful that people uh, can take time off without fear of um, losing Lose. their job. But the problem is it's unpaid. It's unpaid. And for a lot of low income workers, that puts them in a terrible choice um, to do to, to stay home, um, but lose the wages that they need to pay the rent, put mm -hmm. food on the table and do everything else. So um, going forward, if I just want to leave people with one um, one thought going forward, um, this pandemic has really highlighted our need um, for paid sick leave uh, for workers, uh, both during the pandemic and even uh, going forward. So hopefully that's a point of activism we can work on going forward. Right. And I think, Kevin, when you say that, do you mean legislated paid sick days where the province said this is part of the provincial um, law as opposed to relying on employers to give people paid sick days. Are you talking about legislated sick days? Yes, I think that would be a change that we'd need in our legislation. Uh, many employers do provide paid sick leave and there's a lot of value in that um, for, for not having people who are sick in um, uh, coming to work because they just can't lose the income. But we do need, um, we do need to make that, that law um, and to find a way um, to ensure that workers who do miss time because they're sick and they are staying home uh, don't miss out on the wages they really need. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that excellent high-level encapsulation of so many of the different um, changes to benefits, changes to programs like EI and advocacy points around legislated paid sick days. That's really, really helpful. And I'm going to now introduce our next speaker who is from WISH. Uh, her name is Mebrat Bayena. She is an Eritrean born in Ethiopia and raised in Montreal. As executive director of WISH and co-chair of Living in Community, Mebrat supports women and initiatives related to the health and safety of women and gender diverse people engaged in street-based sex work. She has worked in social justice, nonprofit management and community development for over 20 years. Mebrat has worked closely with women and women serving organizations as a program officer with the Status of Women Canada and has served as the executive director of PeerNet BC. Welcome to our webinar, Mibrat. Thanks so much for having me, Gitanjali. Nice to, to be on this with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay, well, I'll jump in. It's uh, really great to listen to TJ and Kevin who both um, helped to um, sort of set the scene for what, what it looks like here in Vancouver and then also in, in the downtown east side, which is a really interesting neighborhood. Um, but what I want to do is just set the scene for you in terms of who the who the folks are that we support at WISH. Um, and as you mentioned, I, sh I should definitely uh, mention that I am an uninvited settler on Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh lands. And I am also an uninvited settler to all of Turtle Island. Um, and at WISH and myself personally do my best to work in solidarity with those who have stewarded these lands for time immemorial. And um, myself being a person who 
whose family and whose people have been dislocated uh, from la from our lands because of colonization and resulting um, conflicts, uh, I, I tend to be really live to these issues. And uh, so much of what we deal with at Wish is is just hopelessly intertwined with the issue with the ongoing impacts of de of uh, colonization of, of residential schools, 60 Scoop, and today's version of 60 Scoop, which is of course uh, the child welfare and apprehension system. So at WISH, as you mentioned, we are supporting street-based sex workers and the focus on street-based sex work as opposed to any other form of sex work is because street-based sex work has the least amount of choice and the highest amount of danger. So the women and gender diverse folks that we see, 100% are low income, 90% are living with mental health issues, 90% um, are living with substance use issues. Uh, over 80% are either homeless or precariously housed. And within that is also folks who are trading sex for places to stay and sometimes staying in relationships um, that are ultimately unsafe uh, in order to secure places to stay. 63% right. uh, are living with disabilities. A lot of those are hidden disabilities as well, but a lot of those tragically are also disabilities resulting from trauma, from right. abuse, from violence, from predation. And that's really important to note. Um, it's, uh, this is a population that uh, it isn't one incident of trauma in the past, it is ongoing targeted trauma. Um, over 45% of the women that we see at WISH are Indigenous. So whereas in the greater population, Indigenous people make up about 2% of the population here, what we see in the downtown east side is over 50%, and uh, some of those numbers mimicked within WISH as well. Um, and it's similar for Black and other racialized folks, where, whereas black folks, we make up about 1% of the uh, greater population. At Wish and in other places in the downtown east side, it can be as high as 4%, and yet no reflection of that within programming, or um, even in terms of just recognizing what that means demographically. Um, incredibly high number of LGBTQ, uh, two-spirit, gender diverse folks. And this is really important when it comes to the context of street-based sex work because the intersection of race and gender actually makes um, street-based sex workers targets of predation and violence that does not, like it, it just, it, it carries on without impunity. This is a population that is seven times more likely to face a violent death. And we are operating within uh, and TJ has TJ outlined them. We're operating within a series of pre-existing crises and pre-existing pandemics, um, and what I would actually call humanitarian crises within the downtown East Side. All of which became deeply exacerbated by the pandemic um, and others that have been very plainly laid bare by the pandemic. What street-based sex workers faced with that first wave, and as soon as this pandemic, as soon as we all started to understand what this was, sex workers would have been the first members of our communities to face a sudden and complete loss of income. And for street-based sex workers, the, the majority of whom we see are resorting to sex work and maybe have chosen it under duress and under within a context of poverty and lack of choices, um, and who are certainly doing so to, to supplement what they're receiving from income um, assistance or disability assistance, for that income to be suddenly and completely lost meant that it was also income that wasn't going to be replaced by any other either emergency cash relief or any of the programs that came online uh, federally. And so may I ask, yep. it sounds like what you're saying also is that the income assistance programs are providing income that is not adequate. Absolutely. Whether, Absolutely. Whether like that people cannot survive. Or disability, right. Yeah, people cannot survive on the uh, on the amounts and have had to supplement it through a whole host of activities and um, incomes that are 
informal within the informal economy within the cash economy and which are also uh, criminalized and this is already a population that is deeply surveilled um, highly stigmatized and criminalized and in a context where we constantly see poverty at the root at the root at the root being criminalized over and over again. Um, but what we saw within the pandemic for folks who are or were either precariously housed or unhoused, we saw now complete street homelessness happening. We saw people getting kicked out. We saw women disproportionately being kicked out um, of places they may have been couch surfing in or trading sex for. Uh, TJ described the, uh, the, the, the newly restrictive or increasingly restrictive guest policies in congregate housing settings. And that had a really negative um, impact on street-based sex workers, cutting out that whole option for working safely indoors. Um, those who, so for those sex workers who continued, who needed to keep working, the type of sex work that remained um, has largely been quite unsafe, right. uh, sketchy for lack of uh, a better description, and where more exploitation and more violence has been happening. So you, I think all of us have heard um, uh, women's activists and women's organizations across the country all sharing how violence against women has increased during this pandemic. Well, that is certainly the case and then some for street-based sex workers where both the work uh, has almost completely dried up and that, that the, the work that remained has become very dangerous and also has further pushed the trade underground. Right. Um, we also saw really, really basic needs like sanitation being cut off from this population, access to uh, Wi-Fi, which for a lot was pretty much the only connection to everything, information, update, news, connections, uh, addressing isolation. Yeah. So, you know, early on, we started to see uh, women showing up in in, uh, and forgive me for being graphic, but in blood stained, feces stained and urine stained clothing because so many places shut down or limited their hours. So many places had to stop accepting clothing donations from the general public. And so really, really basic needs of access to bathrooms, access to showers, access to clean clothing let alone access to work and income replacement was just decimated across the board. Um, so for street-based sex workers trying to access things like CERB, um, when it's when the trade is clearly criminalized, right, even right. those that those that might have been eligible, the 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 sheer terror of putting yourself on the radar as uh, officially as as having made income from sex work is really quite daunting um, and folks never knowing what might happen after the pandemic is any of that going to get clawed back yeah and what are the re repercussions of now officially uh, listing sex work as one of your incomes so this you know right across the country sex work support organizations were making the call for specific supports to to respond to this community and to support this community including emergency cash relief that is administered through sex work support organizations that have the relationships on the ground um, uh, and none of that was responded to so so to this this refusal to to actually name sex workers. I think the closest that the federal government could come to was to, to keep talking about vulnerable communities and vulnerable women, as opposed to outright naming that there are- Who's actually- are, Exactly, that there are members of our population who, who are using sex work as their income and that that has been lost. So if you are stuck in the morality of sex work and if you are stuck in the legality of it while people's lives are in the balance, you can clearly see what the implications are for people who are sc scraping by. Um, I have a question. Um, Kevin had mentioned the BC recovery benefit. Are there barriers for the population of sex workers that you're talking about or self-employed sex workers um, to accessing that BC recovery benefit? Right. Um, 
Yes, and I would say that the barriers are around um, <laughs> everything from lack of ID to ID keeping that keeps getting stolen to lack of stability to even uh, get paperwork in order and maintain paperwork. Yeah. Um, there's the there's a lot of pieces around huge distrust and fear of accessing them. So I would say that there's less, there's fewer barriers around the provincial side than there is around the federal side. Um, but we still see a lot of challenges in terms of navigating the bureaucracy. So the amount of one-on-one -on -one case management support that we've had to do has really skyrocketed. People's individual situations are so much more complicated now during the pandemic. And then the fact that so much of it has to be accessed online when uh, that is not an option. And so even for us, we've had to limit the number of people that can physically be in the building at any one time means that the amount of time our staff have to sit with participants at computers is also limited and challenged. Uh, so, so that that's been our struggle, and that's been the struggle for a lot of the folks that we support at Wish. Thank you so much, Mibrad. I'm going to ask uh, Kevin and TJ to come back and join us in our last ten minutes, so we can have a little bit of a group discussion. So, so many interesting points raised uh, by all three of you around um, challenges, experiences, and I'm going to ask you what. What can regular people do to support some of the advocacy efforts that you have talked about? You mentioned paid sick days. You mentioned greater access to benefits and then all of the housing stuff. What can, what can the average person do to support these efforts? Uh, there's a myriad of things that people could do to support um, financially. Um, you know, just a... Uh, <laughs> Many ways. I mean, uh, yeah, there's a, a, a fund called the Downton East Side Response um, Fund that you can donate to. Um, I believe I shared that link. Um, and they're doing like really essential work to distribute everything from phones to food to clothing. Um, yeah, it's a uh, it's really crucial. You know, they're doing a really great work. Also. Um, just listen to what people with lived experience are advocating for too. follow their guidance. Um, they're the experts in their own lives and know what they need most. Um, yeah, I'd say follow their lead. Um, you know, look to those people in, in your respective communities. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kevin, Mibrat, do you want to add to that? Sure. I can, I can jump in. So, uh, you know, organizations like Pivot um, and WISH and BC Civil Liberties Association, West Coast LEAF, uh, so many of these organizations are, are, are amplifying what experiential folks are uh, ex experiencing and describing. And so all of us are trying to further signal all of the, all of the impacts, everything from the impacts of police and, you know, our fight against street checks and our fight against um, doubling down on policing at this time. Uh, mm -hmm. So to, to look to what organizations are calling for or to educate yourself on on the different calls to action that different organizations have made and, and for, for sure the actions that WISH is making is deeply informed by the sex workers that come to wish and it, and it's it's based on their words and their experiences that we are amplifying these messages around um, true poverty reduction around increasing housing and around um, addressing stigma of uh, criminalizing poverty and criminalizing informal work. So uh, there's all of these pieces that I think just reading up on and then um, starting to inform yourself on and either joining those calls to action and also, go, you know, writing to city councillors, writing to MLAs and writing to MPs. Um, really does make a difference, especially at a municipal level. I think people tend to go federal right off the bat, but actually being able to reach your counselors in each municipality is really quite significant. Yeah, and I was gonna ask too, I mean, like what if WorkSafe BC 
decided to include sex workers as workers mm -hmm. whose advocacy, I mean, whose safety at work was something that they needed to protect and provide remedies for. Like, right. I, I, exactly. I'm the first person who thought of this. So no, exactly. And uh, this is the thing that even as we, as we start to work even closer with the labor movement um, in terms of really talking about sex workers rights as workers, yeah. that, the pandemic has really laid bare the fact that the, here we go, here is a group of workers that don't have the same rights as other workers in other industries. And in fact, mm -hmm. are often being punished for having the audacity mm -hmm. to request the same types of protections and also the, the same ability to refuse unsafe work, but to then be compensated. Uh, to, and Kevin drew those distinctions really quite plainly, but here's a population, here's a group of workers that don't have access to the same um, to the same supports, and that's just not right, you know. And that's that's definitely a clear call to action um, that all of us could be joining in on. Mm -hmm. And and if I could, I think um, your comments about th that conversation being led by the people with the lived experience, especially when we're talking about moving a big government um, or at least public body into the, you know, into people's lives um, to ensure that's done in a way that's helpful. Um, and especially when there is a lack of, of, um, of trust for so many reasons. So um, really interesting conversation, I think. Um, and, um, and, and one definitely worth having. Mm -hmm. And Gitanjali, I'm sorry, can I just also jump in? I, this is such a great question, what the average person can do. There's so many calls to action around defunding police, around decriminalizing simple possession, and around decriminalizing sex work. Yeah. Um, that These are things people can absolutely join the call on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I wonder, just this, I don't want to stop this conversation, even though we are running out of time. However, um, could you, could one of you just um, make the distinction between decriminalizing possession or sex work and legislating around those pieces that are currently, you know, in the criminal code as offenses? I can speak on the sex work piece, and I'd love anybody else to jump in about the uh, decriminalizing uh, around uh, uh, drug uh, drug use, but um, the call from sex workers themselves is not to legalize the trade, but to decriminalize it. So legalizing it would actually um, could actually put uh, sex workers at harm as well, and also those who are. Um, from equity seeking groups will tend to be quite disproportionately harmed by legalizing it and also just takes agency away from the community and from sex workers themselves. But decriminalizing it certainly in terms of changing the, the, the current legislation, which uh, the, the, the whole point of it from Harper, under Harper's uh, administration was a shame the John approach. It's an approach, it's a, the Nordic model of trying to criminalize the purchase of it, but not the selling of it. So, but it makes no, it makes no sense. Like the legislation actually makes no sense. And, it and you're talking about the protecting, I'm going to have to use scare quotes, the protecting communities and exploit, exploited persons act. Mm -hmm. this is the, yeah. Exactly. All of these things we, oh yeah. I, I would like to protect exploited communities. Of course that, you know, these, these horribly named legislation, but the, the current prostitution laws, quote unquote, um, are, are, absolutely not what sex workers are calling for. And it makes it uh, really difficult to stay safe. It makes it difficult to em employ the help that you might need, security that, might you, that you might need, um, the communication of, of, the, of the work and the negotiation of it. All of those pieces are uh, criminalized. And those are all the pieces that anybody would, would use to keep themselves safe. I am going to thank you, all three of you, so much for this amazing conversation and all of the information that you shared with our viewers and listeners. And I'll be reminding people that our captioning with ASL and uh, French and English will be posted in a few days, and you'll be able to find that on the egal.ca website, where you can find all past episodes of our COVID 19 legal information series um, and the captioned the captioned versions and 
thank you to the audience for showing up and um, <coughs> excuse me, please send us comments, feedback, and questions at legal dot at legal at egal dot ca. And next week, March sec, Tuesday, March second at two p.m. Atlanta Daylight Time or two thirty Newfoundland Standard Time, we will be in the East Coast, featuring speakers on housing and employment from the PEI Human Rights Commission and the Public Service Alliance of Canada, based in Nova Scotia. So. Thank you for joining us and remember, stay safe, stay informed and wear a mask. Bye.